All right, I'm going to take that as a cue to start. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. By show of hands, who's attending Paris Blockchain Week for the first time? Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to share this experience with you as it is my first time attending Paris Blockchain Week as well. And to all my veterans out there, thank you for being here. We're all going to make it. Today, we're going to answer many questions, but the, first, but the main question we're going to answer is, how do smart contracts on Stellar stack up? Once again, thank you for being here. My name is Julian Martinez, Senior Developer Advocate and Common Man here at SPF. <laughs> and my goal is to tell you a little bit about what Stellar is, to provide a mental model of how it works, and ideally give you a sense of what you can do with it and how you can use it to build interesting things that make the world a better place. I'm going to start off by giving a high-level explanation of what the Layer 1 blockchain called Stellar is. Stellar is where blockchain meets the real world. Stellar is where blockchain meets the real world. It allows you to convert cash to digital assets in a borderless economy. Stellar is a decentralized, fast, and scalable, and uniquely sustainable blockchain the network launched in 2014 with the goal of creating equitable access to the global financial system through blockchain technology. The SDF, or Stellar Development Foundation, is a nonprofit group and group that I work for is one of many groups in the ecosystem working towards the growth and development of the network, helping unlock the potential of builders and entrepreneurs worldwide who are solving the financial access problem for their communities. One cool thing about Stellar is its consensus protocol, so the Stellar consensus protocol, or SCP, does not use proof of work, it does not use proof of stake, it uses proof of agreement. This is essentially a voting-based system run by validators who are known entities because they have self-identified, and all validators specify sets of other validators they must agree with to reach consensus. Some of the benefits of participating in the network is that um, it's open membership, meaning anyone can participate and join as a validator. No capital is required to be a validator, unlike proof of stake, and it has super fast finality. Now, how fast are we talking? Blocks are finalized every five to six seconds. This is because Stellar uses the SCP, which provides deterministic finality. Now, we're not gonna unpack everything about the Stellar Consensus Protocol now, but if you wanna talk more about it, then please stick around to after the presentation. Be happy to talk with you. Uh, moving on, here's what we're going to cover today. What distinguishes Stellar from other blockchains? Why Stellar is late entering the smart contracts is an advantage? What's included when you build on Stellar? What the future holds for Stellar? How you can get support for your project? And quick show of hands, who here is a developer? Awesome, thank you for being here. Please sit with us until after the first half of the presentation for an exciting coding session and developer workshop led by none other than Tyler Vanderhoven. So, first things first, what distinguishes Stellar from other blockchains? Stellar has unmatched utilities. In the realm of tokenized assets, which includes US treasuries, bonds, and cash equivalents, there are over $360 million worth of tokenized assets issued on Stellar. Stellar has global on and off ramps to provide opportunities to go from cash to crypto and vice versa. And over the last decade, Stellar has built a reputation for being a fast, affordable, cross-border payment system thanks to its consistently reliable network. And with that in mind, let's see how these capabilities are being leveraged in the real world. For example, Franklin Templeton chose Stellar to build the first U.S. registered mutual fund to utilize a public blockchain for processing transactions and recording share ownership. For global on and off ramps, users can deposit local currency into their digital wallets by converting it to USDC at MoneyGram locations and similarly convert USDC back to local currency. And for fast cross-border payments, the IRC delivered around $2 million to Ukrainians in need the Stellar Aid Assist, the SDF's bulk humanitarian aid disbursements program. And now, only on Stellar, cash to DeFi exists. Point blank period. Developers can now have access to a potential user base of 1.4 billion unbanked people across the globe. This is because 
MoneyGram bridges the gap for those without a bank account, breaking down barriers, empowering every user with access to digital transactions, making life more convenient, connected, and inclusive for your users. Now, there are many types of upgrades out there, including UI enhancements, backend improvements, but this is an accessibility upgrade. It establishes a tangible connection from cash to crypto on-ramps right into your decentralized application. So here's what this looks like. Let's say a user of a Stellar wallet like Beans, which is a non-custodial user-friendly mobile app, on-ramps through MoneyGram, they hold Circle USDC and deposit into a blend lending pool. This is Beans, MoneyGram, Circle, and Blend all interoperating without friction thanks to the utility of Stellar. And now, the introduction of native smart contracts means builders can now leverage all of this stack, all of this utility for things like DeFi, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and so much more. Now, some of you out there might be thinking, I've already heard of smart contracts, they've been around for a little while, aren't you a little late to the party? To which I would reply, yes, <laughs> Stellar is late to the party, but this is actually an advantage now, why is it an advantage? Well, we'll cover this in the section here. Why Stellar's late entry with smart contracts is an advantage. So, while deciding to build a smart contracts platform, the engineering team found some problems, which can be boiled down to smart contracts platforms struggle to, to offer efficiency, speed, and security simultaneously. So the solution here was, was to build a smart contract platform using Rust and Wasm. Long story short, this combination allows Stellar to save validators resources for their computation, computational effort needed for storage costs without compromising on security or reliability. Another thing that the SDS saw that was a huge problem was state bloat. State bloat strains blockchain network performance by escalating storage and processing needs. And on other chains, the blockchain now exceeds 240 gigabytes worth of data. Now, this puts a strain on validators, causes bottlenecks that affect user experience, and ultimately, state bloat is just unsustainable in the long run. It will absolutely kill a chain if it is not ready to deal with this. So how does Stellar avoid this fate? By implementing state archival. In a nutshell, state archival keeps the chain tidy by saving only the data that's in use. Now, how does it do this? All contract data has a time to live, that must be periodically extended. Users are in charge of this because they can set or extend their contract time to live, and contract data is archived, but can be restored if it is used again. Next, the SDF saw that re-entry exploits cause a lot of issues on other chains, so we asked, how can we fix this? Point blank period, do not, re do not allow re-entry by default. This means smart contracts on Stellar do not have re-entry. Many vulnerabilities and errors from in inadequate testing and fuzzing occur. You'd be surprised by how many protocols are still getting hacked by simple arithmetic misconfiguration. So the solution for this was unit testing and fuzzing across the entire stack. Developers can now utilize things like cargo test and cargo fuzz to prevent hacks for their own products. And last but not least, authorization. Uh, authorization logic is not dynamic on other systems, Approval, approving a transaction before trade or the approval before trade process is less than optimal because it, uh, because it requires that users spend fees on gas twice, once for the approval transaction and again for the actual transaction that they were trying to uh, make happen. So for this, we have the Sorbonne SDK auth module. Now Sorbonne is just another name for uh, Stellar Smart Contracts and this authorization model is very dynamic in the way that it offers unique authorization uh, or it prevents uh, and manages replay prevention and enforces users' authorization policies. And it also allows users to save funds by abstracting the approval process for transactions. And the way this is this, the way this is implemented will be demonstrated in the developer workshop after my presentation here. So what's included when you build in, when you build on Stellar? First things first, there is a robust suite of tools ready for production level dApps built by both the SDF and the community. Here we have the Sorbonne CLI, 
This tool was built in collaboration with AHA Labs, an outside contributor, for, which is, and it is a powerful command line tool for stellar smart contract development. The main functionality here lies in the contract suite. So you can actually deploy smart contracts, you can call smart contract functions, create the storage on that smart contract, and last but not least, and my personal favorite, the TypeScript bindings function. So, long story short, this enables you to create uh, TypeScript smart contract objects, which I personally use to import in front end components, and ultimately abstracts away a lot of development time that you would uh, spend building uh, blockchain transactions from a JavaScript SDK. Another tool I use here is the keys method, which actually allows you to generate a key pair and fund it right from the CLI. And in the last year alone, 192 projects were built. Of those, there were two data tools, nine indexing tools, four IDEs, ARPC to node infrastructure service providers, all ready to support production level dApps. One of my personal favorites here is Okashi. This is an online IDE for innovation and iteration on smart contract ideas. You can deploy contracts in a contained environment and debug them there. You can also import your keys and deploy smart contracts on testnet or mainnet. It's got a nice, uh, it's got a nice code development window here, a contract window where you can call the functions. There's also a really cool uh, console output here that you can see uh, the result of, the, of calling the functions right from the front end. And if you'd like to talk more about front end development, we have the creator of Okashi in the audience here, Mr. Morgan White. So please talk shop with him if you so choose to. And what else comes with building on Stellar? Cost effectiveness. Stellar transaction fees are less than a fraction of a penny, which creates a cost-effective environment ideal for startups, and Stellar has a tunable gas model that provides a strong correlation between compute resources and fees. As you can see here, this user who sent around $85 spent only 0 .0000000392 <laughs> US dollars. So if that's not cost effective, I don't know what is. And last but not least, builders get a proven network with over 15.2 total operations, 6.6 .6 billion total transactions, 8.1 million total accounts and growing every day. These stats are based on quarter two of 2004, uh, 2024. So, and if you'd like to see up to date stats, you can go ahead and scan the QR code here. So, what does the future hold for Stellar? That's up to you. With the, with the introduction of native smart contracts on Stellar, the, the smart contracts open up the floodgates for innovation on Stellar. So users can build smart contracts to leverage, users can leverage smart contracts for building things for DeFi, peer-to-peer -peer lending, collateral back tokens, smart contract tooling, DAO tooling, and so much more. What else is in store? Optimized performance. In a nutshell, um, oh, multi-thread support will come to Stellar. In a nutshell, multi-threading enhances a program's performance and responsiveness by enabling concurrent execution of multiple operations, thus ensuring efficient CPU usage and improving execution time. Now, if you're already building a project, how can you get support for your project? This will be covered here, how you can get support for your project. First things first, the SDF offers a startup camp, which is a four-day virtual workshop designed for startups interested in leveraging Stellar for their projects. There are mentors in the program, including Stellar experts from within the community, as well as members of the SDF. And this initiative aims to assist participants in refining their innovative ideas into a clearly defined proof of concept, ensuring relevance and value to the Stellar community. The camp provides essential guidance on creating appealing applications for the Stellar Community Fund Awards Program. Now, this is the Stellar Community Fund, and I've got to tell you, it is one of the best in the industry that I've seen. Just last year alone, the SDF has distributed $12 million to 190 projects. First time, first time applicants can receive an award of up to $50,000 worth of lumens, and if they, if they apply again, they can receive an award of up to $100,000 worth of lumens. SCF rounds run around every four weeks, so it's a super fast process from uh, project application to acceptance or rejection. 
So in summary, here's what we covered today, what distinguishes Stellar from other blockchains, the way we provide interoperability, why Stellar's late entry into smart contracts is an advantage, the foundation was able to incorporate lessons learned from other platforms into our design decisions, what's included when you build on Stellar, a robust suite of tools ready for supporting production level dApps, cost effectiveness, and a proven network, what does the future hold for Stellar, that's up to you, and optimize performance, and how can you get support for your project through Stellar Startup Camp and through the SCF. Now, we're gonna have a developer workshop in a few minutes, but for more info, please do check out the developer's note. Um, and now we're gonna go ahead and do a quick Q&A while Tyler gets set up. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you. Do we have any questions before we kick off into a developer session? Anything from what we've discussed so far? Julian did such a good job. Everything is crystal clear. Yes, it was. I appreciate it. Julian, you want to grab it? Well, my name is Tyler Vanderhoeven. I'm an ecosystem evangelist, ecosystem engineer, dev I'm not exactly sure what my title is. But I've been working at the SDF for about five years, but I've been building uh, blockchain applications for almost 10 years now. I have been waiting for smart contracts on Stellar for a very, very long time. So I'm incredibly excited to actually be able to present to you smart contracts uh, operating on the Stellar blockchain. Uh, I know that Julian got a quick raise of hands, uh, but who in here is actually a developer, has written some code, developed something, deployed it? Fantastic, super. Quite a few of you, but also not all of you. I'm not uh, naive, this is not a developer conference, but there are some of us here. We band together. Uh, so I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be super, super in-depth, super technical. Um, your devs, how many of you have actually written any Rust, though? Oh, a few of you, all right, let's go. Rust developers, fantastic. All right, so I, I'll, I'll jump into some of the Rust code. Um, but the focus here is kind of quite simple. Uh, the goal is uh, really to kind of walk away with the idea, oh, wow, Soroban easy, anything else is kind of not. Uh, Soroban secure, everything else, eh, maybe. Uh, we've spent a lot of time learning from other ecosystems, right? We've been around since 2014. We launched before Ethereum. Um, we're also not naive, we're not more popular than Ethereum, but we've learned a lot. But we've also been building, we're not new to this. We're not a new blockchain, we're not a new L1. Uh, this is a blockchain that's been around for ages, that's adding smart contract functionality on top of something that's existed for uh, a long time. That's really cool, to be able to take advantage and look at, the, look at the ecosystem, look at all the other smart contract protocols that are out there, learn some lessons, and then build a smart contract protocol that fixes and addresses a lot of those things. We're not the only blockchain that's tried to do that, but there aren't that many that start that also have a lot of liquidity and a lot of history behind them. So this is something that is quite unique. So I'm hopeful that over the next few minutes as we look at the, the code and the deployments and the process that's in place, that uh, it'll be kind of enticing and exciting. And you'll remember uh, from Julian's talk, there's, there's quite a lot of money uh, to be made committing, uh, submitting to things like the Stellar Community Fund. Uh, we're well-funded, ready to pay for uh, the ecosystem to build some really cool tools. Where you can also take the things that you've learned building on other chains and pull them on over to, uh, to Stellar. All right, so enough of that. Let's dive into some code. So I've got a, an application here, uh, aptly named uh, Hello World. So uh, this is gonna look familiar for anybody that's uh, built Rust applications, it's just just a Rust app. There's nothing really here that's terribly specific. 
to Silk. This is a little bit different than Soroban, which really is, uh, sorry, than uh, Solana, which is kind of co-opted a little bit of the Rust ecosystem, borrowed some pieces, but a lot of it really feels uh, like, a, like a Solana ecosystem. And Soroban really is just Rust. So you'll start your project, uh, you'll pull in some dependencies, you will have a Soroban SDK. You're going to notice uh, in a contract, one of the, the very first thing is that we don't include the standard library. That might be a bit of a side. Uh, no standard library means you're going to have to bootstrap some of your own stuff, but it means your package sizes, your actual contracts, are going to be incredibly tiny. So they're going to be very fast. They're going to be very secure because you're not importing a lot of boilerplate logic that you didn't write, that you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. So it's kind of a, a blank slate to make sure that what you build behaves exactly as you intend and is also really compact uh, and small. But all that to say, the Sorbonne SDK is going to pull in a lot of the stuff that you would have gotten from the standard library anyway. Things like uh, vectors, symbols, bytes addresses, things like that. Uh, I've got a function, well it's actually a contract here that uh, exports just three functions. And most smart contracts, they're not terribly big, they're just really dangerous because of all the stuff that you're not sure what else is going on. So that's one of the reasons that not having a standard library is really important. Like, make sure you know the packages that you're importing. That's hard to do when you're importing the standard library, or when the standard library comes in and you didn't even realize it was in there. Uh, this is also true even in the Ethereum ecosystem where you've got all kinds of packages, like you want to make sure you're using ones from Open Zeppelin, right, that have been audited, everybody's using them. There'll be a lot of boilerplate code. You're not really sure if you're going to use it all, but at least it was audited. At least it's coming from somewhere that's uh, the ecosystem kind of it has battle tested. But with here, like we've got these three functions, and there's, it's really uh, quite simple. There's not, you know, less than 100 lines. I think it's only 50 lines of code. So that's all great. I'm going to walk through each one of these, and then we're going to so I'm going to walk a little, a little bit of the actual contract. Not too much. Not going to get too into the weeds. And then we'll look on the, uh, the DAP side, the front end side. That's where I spend a lot of my time and where I spend a lot of time improving that process for developers. It's something I really care about. So I'm just gonna quickly walk through these functions. If you haven't written Rust before, it's not terribly foreign. I mean, again, less than 50 lines of code. Uh, Rust is pretty well known for being a terribly difficult language to learn. Uh, if you're gonna use it in your day job for like, big applications, sure, there's a lot of things like borrowing and memory safe, like it's just, it can get a little bit dicey, a lot of things to learn. Uh, it's known for just having a really steep learning curve and then everybody gets to the top and they love it. With most smart contract protocols, and Soroban included, there's not actually a whole lot of that going on because you're, you're, you're pretty resource constrained already. So there's a lot of rust stuff that you're never gonna actually have to in implement or be concerned about. So Soroban smart contracts will usually be really simple, easy to understand, well typed, nothing crazy. I've got three functions here. One for hello. You get this uh, environment variable. It kind of comes in as, uh, for free. It comes from the uh, the environment, the, the Stellar environment. A little bit bigger, yeah. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you get that one for free. You don't actually have to pass that in as a as a, um, an argument from your function call. But this is going to give you things uh, like uh, the PRN, the, the random number generator. Uh, it's all typed, so if you if you just typed uh, env dot, you can get uh, a bunch of different stuff. You've got some crypto libraries, a deployer, so you can write contracts that deploy other contracts. Now, ledger information that you can use for PRNG generation, or you can just saving you know, meta information. There's all kinds of stuff that come for free from the environment. I'm not going to worry about that one too much right now. For the for the hello, we're simply just going to return uh, a vector, which will give us hello, and then whatever uh, the argument to that symbol. So this would be like, uh, you guessed it, world, that we'll pass to that. So our hello function, uh, an incrementer function. So every time that this incrementer function is called, it'll just increase a counter. Uh, if there's no value that's been stored, it'll be zero, and then past zero, we'll just start adding. You know what a counter is, I don't know how to explain that. And then we'll store it. So this will take in a value and then we'll just store it to the ledger. And then the last one we'll look at is called owned increment. So it's an incrementer that's attached to uh, a source address. 
and I want this source address to be authenticated. So this is an address that actually needs to sign for itself, right? So I want to have my own counter, and I want only me, who's proven that I own this address, to actually be able to increase the counter. Uh, the, the storage model in Soroban is just a key value storage, so we'll make this uh, we'll make this key that's kind of a concatenation between this counter symbol and a source address. That'll be the key, and then the value that we store will just be the incremented U32. Okay, so we've got that. That's the contract. We got three nice functions. And the rest of our time will mostly be spent inside of uh, bun tests. I don't know, has anybody here played with bun or is familiar with it? You guys have got to play with this tool. It's pretty new. It's kind of like, uh, you guys know um, Node.js probably. And then maybe, maybe you heard of Deno that came out that tried to usurp the throne and it didn't quite work. Um, Bun is another one that's come out really recently. I'm not a, I am a Bun advocate. I love Bun. It's very, very quick. It's built in Zig. Uh, the team behind it is just fantastic. Um, what I really like about it is it lets me use the CLI inside of uh, JavaScript, but all the JavaScript files are actually like, they have uh, native TypeScript files, so I'm going to be looking at this file really quick. You'll notice it's a TypeScript file, and we have this like, dollar sign, which I get on PTSD from jQuery. Thanks a lot, Bun. Uh, but it gives you like this shell that you can run interactive uh, commands. So I can use the Soroban CLI inside of a TypeScript file and begin to run these Soroban CLI commands. So instead of using an actual like terminal window, I can use my, my home base of, of TypeScript to run all of these commands and save outputs. Um, I'm going to build out an environment file. Uh, we're not here to talk too much about Bun, but if, if you see that it's nothing Soroban or even smart contract related, this is just a JavaScript tool that makes it really easy uh, to build out and interact with any, really any CLI tool you're fiddling around with. So this one's, uh, we've got this, uh, the Bun tests file. And what we're going to do is just kind of run through a couple of different CLI commands, which are going to build and optimize, deploy. Uh, handle all the different things for the Soroban CLI, which is then going to get our contract ready to actually start running and interacting with. So I'm not going to I'm not going to spend a whole ton of time again. This this uh, repo I'll, I'll uh, get a link out for it, but I'll walk through line by line here just real quick. When we when we start a app, when we start this uh, deploy function, we're going to get rid of anything that we've already built, so that we're starting from scratch. We're, we'll build that Soroban contract. I like to optimize my contracts. It's one of the nice things with uh, Rust. You can kind of compress, remove all the things that are used or unnecessary. And you'll see whenever we run this command just how small these contracts can, can be when you remove all of the standard library um, boilerplate. I'll make a network. I'm going to be using a local uh, network just because you never know with the Wi-Fi here. That, uh, there's a Docker containers that we have that can run uh, all the different networks, test networks, the actual mainnet network. I'll have a local one that I'll stand up here in a minute. Uh, we're going to make a kind of a shortcut to that network. Uh, here in this line, we'll grab a, a new key that we'll fund on our local network. So it's kind of like spinning up our local network from scratch, getting everything set up. Once everything is set up, we'll deploy that new contract, and you'll see that it's just a WebAssembly file, so the Rust gets compiled down to WebAssembly. Sorbon is a WebAssembly VM. So anything that compiles down to WebAssembly works. Uh, we, we've got an assembly script that's getting written. I, I would really, uh, there's some work being done on a um, Solidity compiler down to WebAssembly. It would be really cool if that went live, but I like Rust. We'll deploy that onto the local network. That'll give us our contract ID. And then we do this uh, magical piece right here, which is actually going to generate a TypeScript bindings library that's specific to this contract. So you may have interacted with like JSON ABIs before, which give you some semblance of what your contract can do. What I really like about the TypeScript bindings is it actually gives you an NPM package that's a TypeScript file that's fully typed on all the arguments that your contract can uh, grab a hold of. And then it gives you all the functionality for being able to interact with your contract get things signed, all fully typed. So you'll get type ahead helps as you're, as you're using it. You can also like bundle that up as a contract, deploy it to like NPM, so other people can just pull in your contract bindings and use it. 
the, fi the final thing we do is actually once we've got that bindings library built, we need to install it. So we do a bun install. You can see if we look at the package, I have a link, a link to it. But if we're uh, like updating it, we need to make sure that we uh, force install that. And then the last thing I do here in this file is just make an env.local, which gives me some local variables that I can use when I actually get ready to uh, call my contract, which we'll look at in um, the index file. Looks like I made a change here. I'm going to remove all that, make sure I don't actually mess myself up. You thought the other type was really small. Let's see if we can make that a little. So I'm inside my terminal window here. I'm going to run that, um, get into my test file. I've got a Docker command here. Can I run? This is what it's going to run. So it just runs our Docker quick start. Make sure it's running on this local network. It stands up the necessary uh, endpoints. So we've got an RPC service that we need to make sure is running. With any luck, that will actually work. That should go pretty quick since it's a local network. And then we should be able to uh, do run, run, deploy. Drum roll. Every now and then I have to restart this one and try again. You can look right here. The, uh, the contract when it was originally uh, built was 1,128 bytes. That's small. When we do the uh, optimize, we actually get it under 1,000 bytes. That's a really, wow. really small contract. And it has all of those functions, all the types that's necessary, all the information that we need to be able to create an NPM package from that. Wow, first try, it worked. Now we can run, oh, well, before we run it, so we've got everything deployed, everything's ready, everything's on our local network. Hopefully. Uh, let me run through the uh, the index file here. So this is this is kind of like the meat. We're going to import our contract. This is what it would maybe look like on your front end application. A lot of the work that I do is actually on uh, like Node.js or something in the back end, maybe Cloudflare. Um, but any time that you're actually consuming your application in something like TypeScript, this would, this might be what the interface would look like. So we built out our TypeScript bindings library, and now we're going to interact with it. We generate uh, a key pair that comes from that bun secret. So I kind of save, I, I built, deployed, and funded my own accounts. And so I'm just going to grab a hold of that, reuse it. But then I set up this, so we import this uh, Hello World SDK, which that's the SDK that was built for our Hello World contract. And it's got a, an export called client, which will give us a new uh, contract interface for that Hello World contract. So we set it up, we point it to an RPC URL so we can actually run deployments and look up things on, uh, on chain from this contract. We uh, pre-fill it with a public key, so this will be like the default key that's used as the source account. Uh, we pass out a method that we'd like it to use whenever a transaction needs to get signed. And then we're ready, uh, we can uh, start cooking the gas. So let me kind of show you this TypeScript look ahead thing. So we've got that contract constant variable. And when we type a, a dot, we can get the TypeScript, hello, increment, owned, increment. Those are our methods. Those are the functions that existed inside of the, the Rust contract. So if we, we pull in that hello world one, I know that it, from the, the TypeScript, it takes a two argument, and that two is a string. You can see I've already done it down below. So that's going to send the argument of two, which again, if we look at our contract library, that's that two argument right there. And then it's going to pull in a string. Now obviously we have to do some uh, pulling between, um, well the Rust says it's a symbol, but symbols don't exist on JavaScript, so there has to be some magic that gets done that says, well what kind of type is that? So there is, there's a, a JavaScript SDK that is imported inside of the, the kind of the magic of the TypeScript bindings that will say a symbol is related to the string, so if you pass in a string, we'll do the work inside of the, the client library to turn that string into something that Rust can take as a symbol. All that stuff is handled for you so that all you have to do is do contract dot whatever your function name is and pass it the argument with whatever type it's telling you to, in this case a string. And then it's going to print out the result, which in our case should be a vector including uh, the first string or symbol of hello and then the last one we're also we should see a vector in Rust is very similar to an array in JavaScript, so we should see that printout in the console. An array, where the first argument is hello, and the last one is world. 
And let me let me uh, let me comment this stuff out. We'll go ahead and run that. I feel like we're getting too much code and not enough execution. So let's run bun run index. Because if I'm going to run into a bug, I want to run into an Hey, look at that. Uh, it works. We got our array. Hello world. You also noticed that it went really really fast. Um, that was faster than five or six seconds, which is our close time for ledgers. And that's because this isn't actually executing anything on chain. This is just a read. So it's just pulling from the, the, the blockchain. I mean, if you look at the, um, the function here, there's nothing in here that's saving data. It's nothing in here that's doing signing. This doesn't actually need to execute on chain. It just needs to run a simulation. That's what we call it. So since we don't actually need to execute anything, we can just run a simulation, get the information, and print it back out. If you're familiar with read uh, entries, the rest of these will be writes. So they will take a little bit longer because it will actually need to get signed and then submitted, validated on the network. OK, so let's move into the increment. Uh, this one's very, very similar, other than with here, since we're not actually signing anything, we can just get the result and print back the result. With increment, since we're actually saving something to storage, we'll need to get this signed and then submit it. And that comes from our increment sign and sender. It comes from this sign and send method which I'll use again down here, which is why I'm giving it a new, a new name. The increment sign and send, this is going to basically take whatever the, the transaction needs to be to actually get it submitted, and then it's going to send it to this sign transaction method, which takes in the, the transaction, and then signs it with the key pair that we generated from up above. So this is a funded key pair on the network. It'll sign it, and then get that submitted. So let's go ahead and run this again. I'm going to comment this one out so we don't get two printouts. We've already seen that one. So this one will take a little bit longer. What do you think will happen with our incrementer? It should be 0 and then plus 1, so it will be 1. And if we run it again, it will be 2. Look at you guys. You're so smart. 3. Fantastic. We know how to count. Uh, but obviously, that's cool, but also very useless and boring. What I want to do is uh, own this incrementer where the uh, incrementing is owned by an account. So if I have an address, only I'm allowed to increment my, my special counter. And so that's where authentication comes into play. You can see like the code for increment and own increment are essentially the same, with uh, the sole real difference uh, being our, our symbol is having um, this concatenation of the symbol short counter, which we had up here, but we're actually also adding the address so that the key is both of these things put together. And then we have this source.require auth. So addresses, which can be contracts, it can also be native stellar uh, accounts, you can require auth on them so that when the transaction is getting simulated, what, what comes back to the client is going to say, hey, there's something in this contract that needs to get signed, and it needs to get signed for this particular address. And then it'll be up to the client to provide that type of signature and then pass it back. So it's not going to be a borrowed. You're not going to get message.sender. You're not going to borrow the authentication of the transaction submitter. You actually get to put in whatever addresses you want signed. And then you get to figure out, is it multi-sig? Is it a stellar address? Is it another contract? There's a, a ridiculous amount of flexibility with how you actually can uh, have authentication work inside of Sorbonne smart contracts. This was a very deliberate decision. It's a little bit um, foreign at first if you're coming from like a Solidity uh, environment, but having this ability right off the get-go of being able to compose your authentication exactly how you want, I mean, I, for me, it's a superpower. Uh, it's hard to get authentication right, and if there's something that shouldn't be hard when you're talking about dealing with people's money, uh, it's authentication. So having this type of flexibility built in right from the, right from the very beginning very composable is uh, fantastic. So how does this look, though? You might think it would look pretty, pretty difficult, and it is a little bit different. If we look at our contract, which actually uh, pulls out this owned increment function, we're actually going to need to generate a new account. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to have the, uh, the transaction, like the outer transaction, is going to get signed by one account. That's going to pay the fee. But then inside that transaction is the actual contract invocation. And that's going to get signed by a different account to the outer account to sign just for the submission and the fee, and then the inner account, which is doing the authentication. So these will be two separate accounts. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new account. I'm going to fund it. 
so that it can actually do some signing. And I'm going to pass that as the source. You'll remember back from our contract, we're passing in that source. So now the transaction uh, source, which comes from public key, this thing up here inside our original contract, that's the outer, will be different from the inner transaction. And then we simply need to call this method. Remember this one right here, the sign, sign and send that we used above. We have an additional one for signing the auth entries. This allows us to sign the inner part of the transaction. And so we take in that inner part of the transaction for the source, and then we sign that uh, inner authentication. So this, oops, this uh, method, when it pulls in this and builds this require auth, it builds a little um, piece of data that then needs to get signed by the source key pair, and that all gets bundled up into the transaction that gets submitted to the chain. And so that sign auth entries piece takes care of signing that inner part of the transaction, and then we use the same sign and send piece to sign the, the outer. And so now we have these two different signatures that we bundle up into this owned increment uh, response or result. Let me comment out, oh, we already did, super. So when I run this one, I print out the secret key. Uh, if we keep running this, we should see a new secret key and a one over and over again because e each of these accounts has got its own signature, its own account. I want to pass just to prove to you that if you pass the same account, it'll increment itself over and over again. And you might be wondering how that happens. That's just a bun feature. You know what? You probably used parse, uh, argument parsing before, so bun has this as well. So it just allows me to pass in a secret of type string. And then you'll notice down here when I'm generating this additional key pair, I look for a value secret. And if it's a valid key pair, I just go ahead and pull that in versus generating just some random one. OK, so when I pass in the same secret from above, we shouldn't see one anymore. We should see two. two. My goodness, you guys are brilliant. Best counters. OK, so one, two, three, and now it's owned. So so long as I know the secret, I have all the authentication, all the authority that I need to increment this particular account. So hopefully, uh, this is inspiring, um, not because uh, counters are terribly useful, but because being able to separate transaction authority from inner transaction, or I mean, you could you could uh, all of a sudden like the ability to have multi-sig for free, like you don't need just one address. You could have source two, which is also an address, and you need to require their authentication. Now you've got two addresses. This instant composability of pretty complex authentication mechanics. Okay. So that's the majority of what I wanted to talk about. There's obviously way more things that we can get into um, when we're actually talking about building out contracts and how uh, you've, you've seen this uh, term XDR come up a couple of times and I have no idea what that means. I would recommend reading the documentation. There's um, there's loads of really good examples out there, a really robust community of people that are also spending a lot of time thinking about these uh, implementation details and explaining it all. It's a lot of fun to build on a network that is uh, thinking about these problems and trying to solve them. There's a lot of new things to learn and incredible things to build that were not possible or would have been really expensive or complex on other ecosystems. There is one thing, though, that I do want to talk about that I probably, I'm going to take a chance and say, how many people have ever heard of fuzz testing and done any fuzz testing? Yeah, that's what I thought. Not too many. Um, you should be doing it more. And it's, it's uh, building smart contracts is quite dangerous. Like it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to get it right. It's difficult to test. So it's not that maybe you wouldn't, it's that it's not that accessible uh, to do fuzz testing. But fuzz testing is like, okay, you've, you've probably written tests before, right? Where you say, oh, I need to test the happy path of this. Or maybe I even need to test the, uh, the bad path, the, the sad path uh, of my uh, DAP, my application. But you're always, you're, you hard code. Typically, you will hard code values uh, into your application, which say, I'm going to run a test, and it's going to trade 5 for 10 and see what happens. Now I'm going to test a bad path for a negative number, and we'll see what happens. And it should fail, and fail in this way. That's all possible. Uh, inside of uh, Sorbonne, you can write tests. You never have to deploy anything. It's just Rust, so you can use Rust tests to test like the happy path and the sad path with hard-coded values, right, from using 
hello and dev, and if I wanted to, I could pass in something that wasn't just wasn't a symbol, and that would obviously fail. So that's good. But what fuzz testing gets you is kind of testing every single possible path you could imagine without actually having to hard code any of that stuff. So you can imagine. Let's not even imagine. Let's actually look into it. Why imagine if you could see it? Um, I've got this example contract that takes in two arguments, an A and a B argument, as an I-128. If you know anything about 128s or values that are larger than 64, they're massive. And uh, uh, an unsigned variable also goes to, to negative values. So these are enormous values. And you might be touching your contract, maybe you're importing somebody else's contract, you're going to cross different values, and it becomes really hard for you to like, keep in mind all of the uh, variants that you might need to test. I've created uh, a very contrived example that if A equals 7 or B equals 7, it should, it should panic. So it should throw an error. In, inside of a, a 128, the chance of you randomly getting uh, a 7 is kind of small. And so being able to hit these, like if these were buried in some other contract or this was triggered some weird way, I mean, again, contracts can get pretty complex, especially if you start to import others. And you may, you just don't know. You just don't know what, uh, right, if I use a zero here, is that gonna fail? If I divide by the wrong number, is that gonna be a problem? There's so many things that you have to be aware of, and this is why I love fuzz testing. It allows you to like test everything kind of for free by just writing a simple test that rather than importing static arguments, you uh, you basically build a, this input, this arbitrary input value, so that when you run your hello for inputs, it's gonna be input A and input B, and just run over billions and billions of iterations until your contract never fails, and yay, congratulations, you're free to deploy. Or it'll run into an error, it'll save that error, and you can rerun it, fix your contract, find out what the uh, issue was, get it adjusted, and, and then uh, redeploy it. The way that you might have done this, seen this done in the past would be something like a prop test, which we also support. So here's a here's like a basic example. Here, let me uh, run this one. So this would be like the way that most of us are testing these days, where we just have uh, an I-128 min, an I-128 max, we put in some static uh, value, and then we can run our test, and it passes. We might think, congratulations, I'm the world's best smart contract developer. Never realizing that uh, there's a seven in there somewhere and everyone will lose their money. So you might say, good call, I'll make a prop test and I'll run this over a thousand iterations. A thousand seems like a lot, that could take some time. Uh, maybe it'll catch, right? We use the same sort of thing with a random input. So rather than hard coding things, it's just gonna create some random values and toss them in there. Congratulations, you're better than average. Uh, we'll run this over its a thousand iterations, and maybe, just maybe, we'll catch that seven error. We don't. We must be ready for mainnet. Let's let's deploy this thing, let's start collecting uh, everyone's money, or maybe don't, because seven is still out there. Um, so let me uh, open up a new terminal here. I'm gonna change my directory into my fuzz testing directory and I've got this uh, bash program or this bash command I'm gonna run or I can just copy it and paste it and this is gonna run my fuzz test against that contract and I'm gonna be honest with you this could take a while because what it essentially does is take the I-128s for both A and B you thought I-128 was big now try comparing it against also B and it's just going to test over and over and over and over again, billions and billions of times with those different I-128 values until maybe at some point in time it hits, uh, it hits a 7. Most of the time that I've run this, it'll find it in like 2 minutes, maybe 3 minutes. But again, that I-128 is, uh, is a very large value. But assuming that it hits it, and sometime it will, again, when you're running these contracts, there, these values mean things. I'm not a very smart programmer, uh, but I know it means like the, the number of branches that it's touched, like the number of variants that it's covered. So you want to see that number slowly starting to stabilize, where you get some sense that all of the different possible branches that could be tested in your contract have been tested. Oh, we hit an error. What was the error? 
our input. I mean, look at this number. That's what an I-128 gets you. That's massive. Good luck trying to find that happenstance. But then look at B. It was a seven. So now we, we found, through fuzz testing, this mythical seven error that was hidden somewhere in our code. What I, what, and that's amazing. Like being able to being able to run a fuzz test and just like walk away and eat your lunch and then come back and see if your contract got hacked. That I mean that's amazing. I didn't have to deploy this. I don't have to fund this. It's just running as a native Rust test. That's awesome. What's what's really cool about this though is that it actually saves the uh, the crash value here, so you can go back fix your test, and then rerun it to see if it didn't pass it. So in my case, I know when B is seven, I'm like, okay, that's a clue. Maybe if I go in and I see inside of my um, contract here, oh, look at that. If B equals seven, I get panic. What if I just like comment that line of code out, and then I could rerun the fuzz test with that same pattern, it would use that same input that gave me this um, massive number in seven, and I could test and see if my fix actually worked by running that same test. So this, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful tool that you just don't get for free on other blockchains. Being able to test all the invariant paths. One of the one of the main key objectives with Soravon is making it really easy and simple to do safe things. So it's like safe by default. It's not just let's get on chain as fast as we can. It's like, like let's make sure that what we get on chain is really good. It's solid. People can trust it. And that happens because you build good tooling. Not because it's possible, but because it's easy. Like, it's not impossible to do this kind of stuff on other chains. It's just not that simple. And so what ends up happening is a lot of devs forego that. They'll choose not to. We're developers. We want to get stuff online. We want to get it deployed. So making sure that this type of tooling is easy, you don't have to deploy things, you can fix things. I mean, you can judge how expensive it would be for me to have to try and test and then or deploy and then do fuzz testing on things that are deployed. Man, that would get expensive pretty quick. And so being able to test these things right inside a, a native Rust environment without spending anything, pretty awesome. And it's also really fast because it's running on my, um, my own machine rather than inside of a VM. All right, that's enough, I think, for today. We'll, we'll close it there. Um, the repo that I uh, have shared, I should have had a QR code, but you can just go to uh, GitHub Kale Pale. Look at that fancy guy. And then the repo that I was sharing was this uh, Sorbonne Paris Blockchain Week 24. So if you wanted to look at the code, that would be a good place to go. And then of course, stellar.org developers. This is a great uh, space to get started as well. And I would also really encourage, I think it's linked in here, but our Discord server, just a lot of really smart people, way smarter than I am, would actually be able to answer your questions. Uh, give you code helps, and then also you can participate, help other developers. Super fun spot. All right, do we have questions now uh, about anything that I've covered that we want to answer up here, or we're all, of course, uh, Julian and I, Morgan, will be around to answer any questions after. Anything anybody wants to ask? Super clear. All right, we're all ready to go build Sorbonne contracts. Fantastic. All right, well, I will see you on the mainnet. Thank you very much. Thank you.